Just to refresh that announcement, guys, today's level up training, we're doing just sort of a roundtable mastermind today uh, with some of the agents on our team. And we're discussing maybe any sort of hurdles or roadblocks they're running into. Um, maybe any opportunities also you guys are seeing. If there's an opportunity you're seeing right now in the marketplace, uh, type that in as well. It may not be a, a hurdle. It may be something that's working really, really well for you that you feel the rest of the team may need to know. So you can also type that in as well. And we can open up some discussion on that. We want to do a, a roundtable discussion. What do you need help with right now? Or what's something that you think is a great opportunity right now that maybe other people need to jump on? Or what's a sort of uh, thing that's working really well for you in your business that you would like to share? Please go in the chat and type that in. And then we're going to open up the conversation. We need everyone to type something in the chat, guys. So there's a, uh, what is this? 12 people on the on the chat right now. I need 12 entries. What do you need help with? What's your biggest roadblock right now? Or what do you think is something that people need to jump on right now? What's a great opportunity? Or what's something that's working really, really well for you that you feel you can share with the team and contribute to the team today? So what do you need help on or what can you contribute today that you, you would like to share? Please type it in the chat and then we'll just go around the room and we can open up the discussion. Time blocking, that's a great one, Carla. We'll get into that for sure. Stay motivated in this cold weather. Buyers on the fence with the market, market uncertainty, but not having to do with interest rates. Okay. Good stuff. These are all good things to talk about. One thing I want to contribute today is new construction homes. Something I heard on a mastermind earlier. I was on a training this morning. Uh, incentives. It's a lot of wiggle room right now, a lot of incentives right now and commissions and stuff that they're paying out. So we'll talk about that. And guys, I want you to view this call today as free coaching, free on the spot coaching. You have an issue, you have a problem, or you got some coaching you can give other people. This is your chance to get your questions answered immediately. Um, so you can have immediate support and go off and crush it in your business. And you got some, some producers on this call. We got Herbin, we got Carla, uh, Jason and I with a ton of experience, Kimmy with experience on the lending side, now transitioning to the real estate. Um, Multi-unit properties. All right, let's go. We got Rob jumping on too, asking the right questions as a consultant like that. All right, great stuff. Um, let's kick it off. We're just going to go down the line. Uh, Andre, you, you got a, you put a pretty general one, right? So let's get specific about that. Andre, please unmute yourself. You put, um, getting people a pre-approved and into contract. Can you be a little more specific on what you mean about that? Definitely. Uh, I mean, I, we heard some stories of other individuals who, uh, you know, had people on the fence or they didn't know whether or not they were their agent. Um, uh, I, my mindset is there's a couple of people that I've been working with and we're already getting to the stages. Some of them want to make offers, but I've yet to like actually get them to be like in contract, I guess, in that, in that sense. And so I was just wondering how I go about doing that. Okay. Um, who can shed some light guys? Someone who has some experience, who's gotten some clients in contract, who can help answer Andre's question or who can try to dissect it for him? Carla, Herman, Rob. Jason. I guess also like, is there an actual written contract? Do I pull that off of uh, the shared files on, uh, uh, you know, Gmail at the drive, or is there an online site that I would go through and just have the contract available? That's a great question. Yeah. Um, who can point them in the right direction, guys? I'll help him. Carla, let's go. You mentioned getting a, 
a copy of a contract? Is there a physical contract that they have to have them sign? And in order for a For a contract, for putting an offer on? Yeah. Yeah. It's the residential purchase agreement, but there's another one that says broker's rep to get them pre-approved and all of that stuff. Is that what you're referring to? Well, I don't think we need to pre-approve. I think we need small more so than the same day. Like they would need like have proof of all that stuff. It's all cash offers. Oh, okay. So, I'll coach him on this one. I think like if you're, if there's a ready and able buyer that's all cash, ask them like we talked about earlier, like the proof of funds. Have you received that? Yeah, yet? I did exactly what you said. Okay, get the so, proof of funds. And then also of course, driver's license if you can. Mm -hmm. And then what's the purchase price? Uh, about 300,000. 300,000, where are they buying? Uh, in San Jose. San Jose, mobile home maybe? Yeah. Okay, okay. I would get the proof of, proof of funds first and have the specific location in mind or property in mind that yeah, they I mean, want to put an offer. Like, we're listing agent too. So if all these things go through. Okay. Then like, the, like I already told them what our ideal offer is going to be. Okay. So we're just what's the ideal see. offer? Well, it's about 285000 uh, and then there, is there like recent comps on that specific area? Uh, yeah, home? they're about the same price. So. Same price? Okay. And how long has been the property in the market? Uh, probably about a, like a month. And then I keep going on and off because people keep on putting offers and we keep not getting exceptions for parts. Mm. So, so, Do you know why? Because um, they don't have the income necessary. Okay. And they're you... usually not cash buyers. They're usually working to do loans. loans. Okay. So. so you have more advantage in this one because it's all cash. So you're probably going to structure the offer shorter than everybody else. Do you have any like requirements from the mobile home already? What they're asking for? Uh, just an, an income of like over 100K. Like they have a list, like credit score, all of that stuff. Oh, have you got no, it? Okay. I've been talking with the listing agent. Mm -hmm. that we can go through those steps as soon as like basically he has an offer that's possibly an escrow. And I'll find okay. out tomorrow or today if that one went through. And how much not, is he's like, if the guy's going to be a cap, we'd rather have your guy come through because it just seems like it'd be less trouble for everyone. Okay. So you're, you're technically as of today, you're back up. Exactly. Okay. So guys, no more let me uh, let me interject real quick, guys, um, to make this call uh, effective. Andre, are who's working with you on that deal? Do you have a senior agent working with you on that deal? Yeah, it's Blanca. I reached out to her today um, just so I could, because it kind of just got real fast, and the guy hasn't been responding for a week, and I finally got back in contact with him, and I was dealing with this yesterday, but I reached out to Blanca, so I'll talk to her about it. Okay. Okay. So, so for the sake of this call, guys, if if you got something that's already being taken care of. I would just keep it that way so we don't take up too much time. We don't want to discuss your every exact deal. We want to make sure we're hitting certain points and fundamentals that'll help everybody. So if Blanca's helping you on that, uh, the best advice is go back to Blanca, let her know that the buyer's you know ready to move forward and um, sit down with her so you guys can brainstorm on what's the best way to go. Um, and so that, that would be step number one. And then if you need a copy of the contract, that's what, something I would advise all the new agents, any new agents to study the contract, right? Um, we can drop one into Slack for you or drop it into, you put a message into Slack. Hey guys, does anybody have, have a copy of a blank purchase agreement and get the copy of the blank purchase agreement. And if you haven't studied the contract guys, I would recommend just printing one out, reading through the contract and understanding all the different terms and, and stuff like that. Uh, and then we could even do a training on that as well. All right. Uh, Kiki, oh. real quick, real quick. Yeah, I, I, guys, there's there's a lot of new faces, uh, new agents, right? Yeah. I think this was like a per. We got a. This is like a really good, perfect, like scenario of what a mentor and a mentee, like like how that works. You see how someone like uh like like Carla was able to come in there and kind of like navigate through the whole process, right? So this is the reason what makes PRG great. If you're a new agent, this is a live interaction of what happens if you if you speak with, a, with an agent. All the guesswork goes away. So you use these guys. They, they use us, guys. This is the reason why we're here. That, that was awesome. Good job, Carla. Yeah, good job, guys. There we go. So I want to just knock this down. We're going to just solve problems today. That's what we're going to do. So Andre, you got some clear direction on what, what you need to do now? All right. Thanks, Andre. Thanks, Carla. Uh, Miles, you wrote down finding buyers. Please unmute yourself, bro. What do you mean by finding buyers? I don't know. It's just, <clears throat> just the way the market is right now, I guess. So I'm just, uh... let's be very specific so that we can help you. Right. Do you, do you need more leads? Um, when you say finding buyers, what do you mean by that? Um, <clears throat> I don't know. Just, I guess more people. I mean, it's nothing that, I guess you guys can do. I should have just went with my other one. I put something else in there. Okay. Uh, okay. I put, it seems like new builds are a win since the lower rates with their lenders, but 
I mean, the, the, there's the finding new buyers or more buyers. I guess that's not really something to put out there. Well, let's dissect that, right? Because if you want to find more buyers, right, essentially what you're saying is you need to find more more clients to work with, right? So let's give Miles uh, three three ways. Jason, can you help Miles? What's three ways he can find more clients to work with right now within our system? Call yeah, so, so immediately what, one thing is this. You, you're going to want to – you can jump into the pond, right? And, and what I would be doing, I'd be filtering the pond to where I'd be looking for people that I've already met, people that have already been set, people that were marked hot within the ponds. We have over probably 7,000 leads. And if you search this with those with those filters, you'll immediately get the lower hanging fruit. So that would be one of the one of the first things that I would do is just go to the pond and filter them through whoever has been set, met, and whoever's been hot, okay? Another thing that we can do, Miles, is you're not on Zillow Flex right now. So that means that you need to go ahead and make sure you understand the LP mama and that you practice your buyer script. OK, so immediately those are things that you can work on so that you can get more opportunity with with the buyers on the Zillow Flex program. Um, the other thing is, yeah, there's also in those ponds, there's also the open house, open house, um, open house leads that I'd be tapping into. So anyone that's physically went to one of our open houses, I'd be giving them a call, a text and shooting them a, an actual video, letting them know, hey, this is what's going on with the property. It's still on the market. If you want to look at disclosures. If you want to look at reports, please, you know, what's the best time for me to contact you? Yep. So there's three ways right there, Miles, right? Go into the pond, filter them out. The most hot ones, appointment set, you can easily do the filters and you can boil that list down to the hottest people, right? And you could just give them a call. Like Jason said, you can get, make sure you get on Zillow Flex, understand what you got to do to get on Zillow Flex. You got leads, your phone ringing, leads coming to you. And then what was the last one again? One more time. Uh, open house leads, right? Filtering out the leads for open houses through our pond as well, because these are actual people that walked into a property, right? So there's unlimited opportunity right there. You just have to now do the, the work and go through them and make those calls and, and contact those people. I promise you, bro, if you focus on, if you focus on calling, you know, 50 people a day, making at least 50 calls a day, you're going to probably get in touch with maybe five to 10 people on those lists. If you filter them first, make 50 of those calls, you'll probably talk to five to 10 people from there. And out of those five to 10 people, there's going to be at least one or two who are still looking to make a move. Right. And that's, that's really what it is, guys. So I hope everyone takes note of that. You just got to make the calls and just call people. And the great thing is that you're not calling, it's not cold calling what we do. We actually are calling targeted people who have expressed interest in buying, selling, came to an open house, came from an online source, Zillow, these are people that you just got to get out there and talk to. Uh, yep. Is that helpful, Miles? Yeah. Miles, 90, I would probably say 90, 95% of our, of our leads that are coming in, these guys are all have raised their hands saying that they want to buy a home. All of them. 95% of the leads that are in the pond are in our database. So they, they, they're, they're warm. You just got to get them. Yeah. And also utilize when you're at, when you're also calling, make sure you're also sending a text message to them, right? I would definitely be saying, I would be hitting them from both a call and a text and even an email. Yeah. Call, text, email, video, all those, right? Just exhaust all your options. Go deep, right? Because some people may not respond to email, but they'll respond to text. Some people don't answer their phone because they don't recognize your number and they're screening your call, uh, right? So to everyone who's in the office, like you need to make sure you are prospecting on a daily basis. There needs to be two solid hours of going through those ponds, going through your lists, going through your leads and, and trying to book some appointments for that day. Uh, it's as simple as that. Um, okay, let's move forward. Uh, Carla, you mentioned time blocking. So this is something that you are strong at. So can you maybe walk us through some of the key fundamentals of time blocking and you know how you set your day up and stuff like that? Um, I think in the next two weeks, that's gonna be like my main struggle, to be completely honest. Um, I have my entire family that I haven't seen in like, five years is going to come visit. So um, I want to spend time with them since I lost time. But at the same time, I want to be realistic on my goals and how much units that I want to close for this year. Um, time blocking wise, I always go for like an 80, 20 rule, you know, 80% of the work and 20%. That's like the most like key fundamentals. So usually my day is always going to be prospecting the first thing in the morning, which we did this morning. It's awesome. Everybody did a good job. And the rest of the day, of course, like it really depends on each scenario, how you guys want to 
structure your day. Everybody's different. Structure is defined differently for other people. But for me, before I start calling at 9.30, I always want to take care of myself first. Take care of your kids, all of that stuff. Um, and the rest is just business from like 9.30 all the way to like when I get done, probably six. And I have a cutoff time. Um, I always want to prioritize myself first, um, even though it's, it's a struggle recently. So it's one of those things. But time blocking, guys, like this is one of the things that is a skill that you need to master. It's, let me rephrase that. You, you must, you must, because there's no excuse. There's no excuse for you to go and get a Starbucks at 9 a.m. and you don't prospect and you just show houses. There's no way. You, there's yeah. need to be a structure if you want to close some deals. There should be a structure for you to get a paycheck. If you're going in a Monday, getting a cup of coffee and then just chill in your backyard, then what do you do? Nothing. I'm just being honest. Yeah. <laughs> there's no way. There's no Carla, way. let me ask you a question. Um, yeah. cause th some of, some of the team right here, they don't know you that well. There's some that do and some that don't, right? We have some new faces. Um, really quick. How long have you been in the business? When'd you get licensed? Um, I got licensed last year in March technically, but I've been in the business for about six years with another brokerage. I was a listing coordinator before I started getting, you know, deals and everything. But I, the first five months, I will completely be honest, the first five months that I was licensed, I didn't get a paycheck. I was actually learning a lot of the things that a lot of top producers are doing. So I was actually a sponge, not just a sponge. I was actually doing the work also. Yeah. So there, there was not an excuse for me to look at properties because I had a MLS and I have a Supra. So there's no excuse. Yeah. Um, and I started doing more transactions now in August. And then, yeah, today it's good. <laughs> so how many transactions since getting licensed have you been a part of now? Um, last year, I closed seven. And then this year, I, um, I'm about to close 25. So I want you guys to hear that, guys. Last year, seven, right? She got licensed in March. But first five months, she said she didn't really do much. She was just more soaking up the game. Then close seven deals. And then this year, she's already 25 deals for the year, right? That doesn't happen without being organized, without being organized and without time blocking. You don't, you don't close that many transactions, right? Because especially as you get busy, you're getting pulled in different directions. You got clients to serve. You got new leads coming in. You got deals in escrow. You got yourself you got to take care of, right? So I want you guys to all take some some you know, some insight from Carla. Now, Carla, have you had life happen during that time? Oh, that's a very interesting question I have. Yeah, I, I, my father passed away three weeks ago, but that didn't stop me from doing the deals. Although it's a very difficult process, but at the end of the day, you have to be realistic. Like life moves on, clients, they don't care, but you do. So you have to be super realistic of like, okay, when I'll give myself a week, then I have to go back. And this is why I appreciate um, Jason and you guys um, pushing me to do the prospecting call today because I, I needed it. You know, there's a lot of things happening in the past two weeks, but detailed wise, it, it didn't happen for me for closing 25 deals because I, I was structured. I was honest and realistic and I was surrounding myself with people who were closing deals. If you're surrounding yourself with people who are just laid back and not closing any deals and they're not really the same mindset as you are, then it's not going to happen for you. Got it. And, and when we interviewed Carla and, and you interviewed to join our team and we talked, we had a long talk. We probably talked for like an hour and a half on our, on our yeah, interview. Yeah, for sure. Um, and we, we, we clicked really quick. And there was something that I saw in Carla uh, that I, I knew why she was having the success and why she would be a great asset to our team and it was her level of commitment it was her sense of urgency that she had it was her passion right it was also her attitude of like i'm going to figure it out regardless you know and i think we can all take away from that you know and then and that's something that i that's why i wanted to ask you have you had life happen because we all have stuff that happens your dad passed away and that's unfortunate i know you've been dealing with that but prior to that, there's probably other things that have happened or other challenges that have come your way, you know, in the past couple of years, since you've been, you know, made your way into real estate full-time as a salesperson where you've had to continue to push through, right? Yeah. That's a conversation we had. Yeah. I mean, maybe guys, give you guys some context. I, I grew up not in the U S I grew up in Manila. My dad is from here, but 
growing up in a very third world country, it actually gives you a perspective on life. A lot of people in the U.S. are very privileged. So put yourself in the client's perspective also coming from different countries. They're buying properties. This is the American dream that they, they say. So for us, American dream is defined a little bit different. Now it's equity apparently, but now it's you just have to be really realistic with yourself. Life happens, but there's no excuse for you to like, hey, like you gotta be honest with yourself. How good, how, how skilled you really are though? What type, of, what type of skills are you lacking? Have you write it down? I told Enrique and Jason at the time, I really wanna focus on listings. So in the past three months, I've actually been listening to a lot of podcasts about listings, reading the listing agreement to the T, knowing the contracts. Like at the end of the day, like if you're giving excuse, someone will do it better than you do. Just being honest. Yeah, I like that. I like that, guys. Good stuff, Carla. Um, if you guys need help, guys, I know Carla is always willing to help. She's a great contributor on our team. Herman, Rob, um, always willing to help, guys. But it, it's good to hear it from someone's perspective that is is hasn't been in the business and the sales part for so long um to see you know her crush it and it takes that level like that's what a lot of, a lot of times what i want to communicate is it it takes doing all that it takes that sense of urgency it takes showing up it takes pushing through the the tough moments it takes time blocking it takes making your calls it does take all that to succeed in our business and if you see any of the people who are producing at a, at a high level on our team they are all doing that in one way shape or form uh, and they all have challenges that have come their way during that time, right? So um, remember, if if you're not having the success that you wish you had, you know, you got to ask yourself, am I doing everything possible to really get out there and make it happen? Because sometimes we're just like a few, some of us got a long way to go, but there's some of us who are right there where we're doing a lot of stuff, but there's just a little bit more we got to do to get that first win. And then you build that momentum and stuff like that. And it works off of momentum a lot of times. So thanks for sharing, for sharing, Carla. Um, and good job. Good job on all the stuff you're doing. Hervin, you're up next, bro. Staying motivated in this cold weather. Shoot, I, I need some help on this one, bro, because I've been like, it's cold. I've been a little congested under the weather. I got some sinus issues going on. And I'm like, some days I'm just, don't, I don't feel like doing it, man. I don't feel like getting up, showing up. Luckily, I have you guys to hold me accountable because there's, commitments that I've, I've made. How do you stay motivated right now, Hervin, to get out there when it's cold and you'd rather be at home chilling in front of a fire or something? I don't know, man. That's my problem. You tell me, how can I? Uh, oh, you're asking, I thought you were going to tell us. <laughs> I thought the, I just got back from Tahoe and I thought that that would, that would be a refresher, but I came back even lazier. So I don't even, I don't know. I need something. Uh, I need a, I need a spark. Okay. Jay, what you got? Who has something? How do you think? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I see, I see Herbie. I mean, he's at the gym, you know, what at five in the morning, man. So I think I see that you're pretty motivated, right? So I mean, I think it's, um, I think you're doing it. What what I've been seeing, right, and talking with you, I think the big thing is just putting putting things that are gonna, like Enrique said, putting things that are gonna hold you accountable, um, and and putting in good habits. So that you just, it just continues. You just continue to go out there and start continuing to do it, right? Um, you know, again, I, I like what Enrique said right now was, you know, there, there, this is a two-way two -way street, right? We hold the team accountable and the team also holds us accountable. So I think it's important to put those things in place um, so that when you don't feel like doing it, you know, sometimes we may let ourselves down but we won't let the team down. We won't let people around us down. We won't let our, our kids down, our family down. So putting those things in place may help you, you know, stay consistent, stay motivated. Yeah. I want to add to that, bro. Um, I think a big thing for me, like, like I said, I, I don't feel motivated every single day. You know, some days are, are easier than others. Some days I'm like dragging ass and I, but I think the big differentiator is that I've committed and I've decided that this is what I'm gonna do, right? There's a difference between being motivated to do something and there's a difference between saying, hey, no, I decided that this is what I'm doing, right? And I think when you decide this is what you're gonna do, it gives you a lot of power and control back because when you decide something, then that means it doesn't matter what's going on. It doesn't matter if, if I feel great. It doesn't matter if the weather's nice. I already decided this is what I'm gonna do, right? And for me, that light bulb went off a long time ago 
when it's like, I decided that a career in real estate is what I was going to do. There was no other option. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. I wasn't going to go and get a nine to five. Like there was a turning point um, when the light bulb went off that I'm never going to go work for someone. I'm always going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to do this. Like no matter what, I'm going to fucking make it happen. And I decided, and I, I knew that there's going to be good times and bad times, but I've already decided. Just like I've decided that, you know, showing up to these trainings four days a week, I've committed to hosting these trainings Monday through Thursday. Doesn't matter, right? Like today, honestly, I feel under the weather, but you know what? That doesn't matter. I've decided that today at 1130, I do my Monday training. That's just what I decided, you know? And some days I'm going to feel great. Some days I'm going to feel a little under the weather, but I'm, I'm going to make it happen. So I think what happens guys and what I realize as I, as I get older and get a little wiser is that at some point you got to decide how you want to play life. You got to decide how you're going to play the game of life, because if you don't decide, then guess what? The world will decide for you, right? Let me say that one more time. If you don't decide how you're going to fucking do life, the world will decide for you because you have all these things happening on the outside of you, right? The economy, your issues, growing up, anything like that. You have all these things pulling at you, but at some point you got to say, no, nah, no matter what, I decide this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a real estate agent. I'm going to show up for call session, regardless if I feel good or not. I've committed to this and there's no ifs, ands, or buts, you know? So I know, I know this is kind of getting deep guys a little bit, but this is what it takes. You have to have that mentality of like, I decided to commit to that. And Hervin, you know, decided that he's going to go to the gym at 5 a.m., right? You decided that that's important to him, you know? And he's been doing it. And then I, Hervin, I know, I know you don't feel like going to the gym at 5 a.m. every single day, right? <laughs> nope. What do you tell yourself though on those days when you don't feel like it? And what do you do to maybe, get, you know, push yourself? I talk shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, well, I mean, yeah, I'm just like, you know, it's going to feel worse if you don't go because then you're going to be, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed because I know I could have gone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, now it's not that hard, but yeah, in the beginning it was super hard, but yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I, I like I like what you guys are kind of saying. Set, you know, hold myself accountable um, to maybe it'll help me to hold myself accountable to somebody else, yeah. and then I can push in that way. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and stay committed to your commitments, right? It's like when you make commitments, and that's the thing too is is sometimes you got to be realistic. Is pick and choose your commitments, right? Pick and choose wisely because you can't say yes to everything. Pick and choose the, the fundamental things. Like if there's certain things about the way you want your life to be, it's a handful of things. Like these are standards that I set for myself. I never go below the standard, right? And sometimes it takes you working towards your standard and then you get to a level and you decide I'm never going to go under that level. And I know like for us, like it, it's even with income, right? Like when you break a milestone in your income, say you want to make your first hundred thousand, it's hard to get from zero to a hundred thousand. But then once you get to 100,000 and you realize what it takes, it's way easier to keep that 100,000 than to start all the way back from zero because you already established the standard of how hard you got to work, how often you got to show up, what you got to do, all those things that got you to that level. And then from there, you have a next level, right? Whether you want to get to 250 or 500 and you now leveled yourself up, right? So... I think we can all take some wisdom from that. And I want, want you to guys all think about what stuff do I need to make some decisions on in my life, right? And, and stay accountable to that. Uh, yeah, I think, the, I think this is over, guys. The training's over. This, that, was, that, was a, that was a good one. Um, good stuff, Herbin. Thanks for sharing, bro. Thanks for, for being vulnerable. Uh, buyers on the fence with the market, the market uncertainty, but not having to do with interest rates. Kimmy said, who can help her out? You got buyers on the fence with the market, the market uncertainty, but not having to do with interest rates. I mean, they're not hearing me. I, obviously, like with some of the buyers I spoke with, it's not the interest rate that concerns them because they have um, 
the income, the means, and they can get um, interest rate a lot lower with different banks. For them, it's more of like, what's happening with the market? Like, you know, sh is it a good time to buy? And I let them know, like, I don't have the crystal ball. I don't know, but you know, what's your goals? Like, what's your long-term goal? What do you want to do with the homes and stuff? Do you want to buy now and, you know, raise your family or do you want to just buy as an investment? And it's, I go basically based on their situation, their scenario. And, um, they understand that, but they just keep asking me more questions about like, what's going to happen with the, in the market? All I can say is like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen. I can just give you data as a fact of what's happening right now, but I can't tell you what's happening in the future. Uh, can, can I jump in, DK? Yeah. Okay. I, I think I think with anything, right, uh, in, in sales, what I've noticed is is you've got to break down the problem, right? And, and um what that means is there's there's two ways of looking at a sales conversation is when you're actually telling them as an authority, right? Which honestly, Kimmy, that doesn't work. It sounds like it works, right? Where you say, hey, listen, you pull out the data. Oh, it's a good time to buy. It's a bad time to buy. I would stay away from doing those types of things and I would do something totally different. What I would do is I would start asking them questions. Hey, how do you feel about the market, right? What do you think is going to happen down the line? right? Start having them get engaged because the, the thing is, is right now you're fighting a battle that you have no idea what they're thinking, right? It's like you're going to a fight and you don't have a, you don't have an idea if they have a knife or a gun or if they have a fist or a bat, right? So well, the way that I would take it is I would go in there and I would try to figure out what type of utilities they have they're going to fight in order for me to kind of counter it, right? If you go in there and you said, you know what, I'm going to take my knife, I'm going to take my bat, I'm going to take my gun, I'm going to take all these things, when in reality, you really didn't need any of that stuff, right? So I think in order for you to find out what the core problem is, I would flip the question around to them, and I would ask them where, they, where they're coming from, where they're having these types of thoughts, and then from there, start to fight the battle from there, right? And that's with any problem. I think, I think to be honest with you, that's with any problem is you want to you wanna take it that route yeah that's good advice rob and and mm -hmm. to add to that is there's probably not a lot of agents who are who are breaking it down deeply with them you know so i think a good exercise is if they're saying hey what do you think is going to happen with the market i would point it right back onto them hey what do you think is going to happen with the market um how would that change your decision right like there's two ways either the market goes down or the market goes up or whatever right there's a couple things that can happen but Mr. Mr. Buyer, let's let's play worst case scenario. Let's say you bought the house today and the market went down. Are you going to sell if the market went down? Is that going to change your decision to be a homeowner in a long term investment? Like, what do you think you would do? So sometimes you got to help you got to help them unpack those questions, almost like you're a, a counselor or a therapist. Right. And ask them the follow up questions to help really get to the root of the problem. And sometimes you can help unravel that. And then they go, yeah, you're right. Even if the market does go down, I still would want to be a homeowner. I don't plan on selling. So what difference does it make like when I buy or not, right? So, you, and then eventually now you can shift them back to, well, let's look at what is important, right? It's not really important if the market goes up or down in the, in the, in the near future. What's, up, what's more important is, do you plan to be here for a while? Can you afford the payments? Is buying, does that make sense for you at this point in your life, right? So I, I think you got to have that conversation and go a little bit deeper with them, like Rob is saying, because sometimes you could be bringing out data and all these things, the, the knife, the bat and the gun. And that's not the fight that you're fighting. You're fighting the wrong fight. Um, I don't know if that is that helpful, Kimmy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think another way to just asking them what is, what is you know, what concerns them about the market. Right? Yeah. There's just different ways and finding your way of saying that. Right. Just finding your way of saying that. And and then they will open up to you. Sorry, guys. They will open up to you. And so once they open up to you, then you can kind of start navigating. Yeah. Yeah, even, then, even, go ahead. Even sometimes, Kimmy, even some of the realization that you might you might come up with is it might they might come up with the realization themselves that it's not a good time for them to buy now. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, if you ever do therapy, and I think Geeka hit it, right? Therapy never gives you the answer. And that's what pissed me off about my therapist. <laughs> I paid a shit ton of money for them to give me the answers. They never gave me the answers, right? But they would ask you certain questions, right? To walk you down the path to basically have that aha moment where you basically, where now you said, oh shit, 
well, let's gotta get my thousand bucks back. You know what I mean? So, so, so you just go down that, go down that method of, of asking questions as opposed to telling them why it's a good way or why it's not a good thing. Right. And, and be open that it might not be a good time for them to buy or sell the property. Right. That's part of being a consultant as a part, uh, as a part to just being a, a, just a regular product. Right. Uh, 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 you're trying to be a consultant. You're consulting them to see if it's a good time or not, right? Yeah. And to touch on the therapy thing, I've, I've done a lot of therapy and a lot of work on myself. And I remember one of the questions my therapist would say when I would bring up a concern, he would say, well, let's, let's talk about this. Do you think that would neg negatively affect you or positively affect you? I go, shut up, just give me the answer. Yeah, and then he just <laughs> stay quiet. And then I go, well... <laughs> you know, maybe negatively affect me. And, and he go, well, why do you think that? And then I would tell him, okay, and what, what makes you think that, right? And how, you know, what can you do at that point? So sometimes we got to be therapists to our clients, right? Hey, the market may go down. Hey, if it goes down, do you think that would negatively impact you or positively impact you? Would that be a benefit to you or would that be uh, negative to you? Why? And then why do you think that, right? Carla, what you got? I think to add to that also, you have to like look at the history and the facts. A lot of people who are actually in the US are defaulting to authority conversations. So you have to really think deeper on why is it defaulting a lot of conversations or more authority? If you notice like if someone is messing up in the parking lot, I, she said this, I said that, like you should come from a place of curiosity the most. Because if you come from a place of curiosity, you help them self-discover what their actual problem is. Not because of like being authority, you would rather come off with collaborative effort. And the question should be how, how does it make you feel? Even though it's therapy, it's just, if you practice this questions, basic questions, every single part of your life and every single transaction you're gonna do, you will understand the person better so you will navigate the situation better. Yeah, that's good advice. and. Remember guys, to get to a point where you can ask those questions to your client, you have to be in rapport also. You can't just met the client, you're on the first call. So how do you feel, <laughs> right? Like you also have to have, you have to build some relationship. You gotta make sure it's in the right context. You, you've already chatted with them. You're maybe doing a consultation and you're asking the important questions. Then at that time, you can start getting a little deep. You don't wanna get deep on the first initial follow-up call to a lead that came in, right? Um, and, and I think guys understand that these are all techniques. So these techniques need to be practiced. It's not just you're going to start being able to, to ask questions this way. So that's why it's, you know, it's extremely important that you role play this. And then you can role play this throughout your day, throughout, you know, with, with, with your family as well. But it's, it's identifying that it is a technique and start practicing this type of technique when you're having these conversations. Yeah. And Kimmy, let's quickly role play this because I think this is good for everyone, right? So just using what I just what I just shared with you on asking some of those questions to get me to figure out the answer, right? If you can you unmute, Kimmy, let's role play this real quick. All right. So Kimmy, yeah, I don't, you know, I'm just not sure if we should buy. You know, what if the market goes down? Do you think the market's gonna go down? I don't know if it's if it's the best time. We can afford it, but I just I don't know. Well, Enrique, do you think the market's gonna go down? Uh I it might, I think it might like be with, with what they're showing on the news. I, I think it might go down a little bit more. Okay. So everything that you've read and heard, if the market does go down, will it impact you right now? Um, I mean, well, if it's, if it goes down, maybe I can get a better deal. You know, maybe I can get a lower payment. So it's interest rate. So mortgage payments are biggest concern right now then. Well, I guess, yeah, I guess making sure I can afford the payment, you know, but yeah, but I already know I can't afford what you already presented to me. You know that you already can? Yeah, but I'm just wondering if like, if I wait, do I get a better deal? Gotcha. Well, I don't know, like waiting if you can or you can't, I'll be honest with you, because I don't know what the future is, <laughs> but definitely, you know, just able to make sure that it doesn't impact you now. And if it could help you get a home at this time, would it make sense for you by now? I guess so. Now, Kimmy, ask me, like, play my scenario. Let's say the market does go down. Mm -hmm. So I want you to run through that. Okay. Way. So yeah. if the market does go down, are you still, what's going to happen? I mean, do you, is there work that's a concern? 
No, I mean, no, I guess nothing, nothing changes. I still want to buy a home. You still want to buy a home. Okay. So why would you want to wait? Why would you want to wait later? If you you still want to buy a home. Um, yeah, I guess I don't. I guess I just, just buy right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, so what I'm getting at, Kimmy, so end of role play, right? What I'm saying is you got to walk me through it, right? So let's flip the script real quick. All right. So Kimmy, let's say the market does go, let's pretend you're the client, right? I'm okay. the so Kimmy. Okay. So yeah, that's one option, right? There's a couple things that can happen. The market can go down. So let's play that out. Let's play out that scenario right now. Let's say you bought a home today. And in six months from now, you know, the market went down and the home went down 50,000 bucks, right? That is a possibility. Now, Kimmy, if it went down 50,000 bucks, are you going to panic and sell your house at that time? Mm, no. Okay. Would you still, does that change you wanting to be a homeowner still? Or what, what do you think you would do if the market went down after you bought I would still hold on to it. Okay. Why would you still hold on to it? So I can get equity. Okay. So do you think eventually the market, even, even if it went down a little bit more, do you think eventually it'd come back up? For sure. Okay. So maybe it going down, you know, in the short term is not necessarily going to impact your long-term decision, right? Because you said you want to keep mm -hmm. it and earn equity, right? Over mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and then let's say, let's say, so that's one scenario, right, Kimmy? Let's flip the other script. Let's say you bought the home right now and six months from now, the property value slowly went up and maybe it went up 25,000. What would you do then with your house? Still keep it. You still keep it? Mm -hmm. Why would you still keep it? So I can go up higher. Yeah. <laughs> right so i guess kimmy what i'm trying to get at is i totally understand your concern right like you're not sure if it's a good time to buy because what if the market goes down but we just played those two scenarios out right if it went down or it went up you're not going to do anything different right mm -hmm. and i think the main focus was making sure you can afford the home now and make sure you get into a good area make sure making sure that it meets all your criteria but even if the market goes up or down in the next six months or a year i think we just discovered together that that wouldn't change what you would do with with the house anyways, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, so just rest assured, Kimmy, that your concern is valuable. You know, it's 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 totally understandable because of what the news is saying, but just rest assured, we just uncovered that you would be in the same position no matter what, and you would still wanna buy a home and you still wanna keep it for the long-term and earn equity over time. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, yeah. You got some time to go look at some homes this weekend? Yes. All right, great, boom, let's book that. Good job, right. Gigan. Good job, Gigan. That was, that was really good. That was really good, guys. At, at the end, if you guys noticed the structure of the whole thing, right, you saw he was asking the questions, and at the end, he was able to tie everything into a nice little package with a bow on top and then wrap everything <laughs> together and move it forward, right? And and he, I, I don't think he, Enrique knows the actual name of it, but but it's it's a it's a game. In, in LP, there's a game that you end up playing where you end up putting these guys into an authority state, right, by asking these certain questions, right? And that's what Kike did. Now, there's a difference between you saying, hey, listen, it's it's a good time to buy. And it was a different way that Kika did where he was he was walking them down as a consultant, holding hands down a pass and asking them a series of smaller questions in order to get to the bigger question at the end, in order to get to the bigger answer at the end. Right. So that's that right there. What you just saw, guys, that was NLP. And I, there's there's a lot of breakdowns that you can get technical on far, as far as sales techniques on what he did. But that was great stuff, guys. So I hope you guys paid attention to that. And thank you, Rob. And do you notice how I didn't say my opinion, whether they should buy or not? I never told them, I think you should, I think you shouldn't, right? I just said, hey, let's walk through that. I understand your concern. Let's walk through it. Let's say scenario one, you bought and it went down. Scenario two, right? All I did was help them unwrap it and, and process it. And then I, I used their answers to just throw it back on them. I think we just discovered together, Kimmy, that no matter what happens, your position would still stay the same, right? Do you, don't you see how we just discovered that? I didn't say, yeah, Kimmy, I, there, you got to buy right now or don't buy right now. I said, hey, based off our conversation, I think that's what we discovered together. And then they're like, and you're like, yeah, uh, yeah, we did, right? You are. So same outcome, right? Getting them to move forward, but just a different door. We took a back door, right? We took a side door. 
We didn't take the straight sales door. Like, yeah, do this because the data says this because that. It was more of a curiosity play, like Carla was saying and, and like Rob was saying, is we're leading them down and we're following their concern and we're addressing it. We're not running away from it. We're addressing it. We're saying, okay, let's unravel that for you, right? Uh, all right, guys, good stuff. Let's see. Let's take one more and we're going to wrap it up. Someone said new builds, accommodating with clients' availability and moving them forward. My, let's unpack that. What, what do you mean by accommodating with clients' availability and moving them forward? Some of my clients are like super busy and they're always traveling. So it's juggling time to meet to like just have a tour sometimes can take a while. So that's that. But um, I did give them a tour yesterday and they did, did, are interested in a property. So hopefully it's going to move forward. Okay. Now, let me ask you a, a question to follow up on that. Do you think you're, do you think this is a high priority for your clients? Um, it is because they know they need to get in contract with it by next month. So um, it is. Okay. They just have a lot on their plate. Okay. So you think at a scale of one to 10, how much of a priority is it for them to get into contract by next month? Probably an eight. Okay. An eight or nine. What happens if they don't get in contract by next month? Um, they probably just have to extend their lease a little bit longer. Okay. What would make them want to hurry up and jump on something right away? Mm. What know. would make them stop their travel plans and say like, let me put everything aside. Let's, let's go freaking get a house right now. When they find like they're like the perfect property for themselves. Okay. Um, are you finding, how many homes have you showed them? Uh, about five or so. Five. They're very picky too. So it's been hard. Okay. So see, that's, that's the thing, right? Is we gotta, we gotta figure out some context to these. Cause what I, what I hear is now here's the thing. If someone, if it's a top priority, then they're going to make time for it. Right. It sounds like there's more of like an opportunity they're trying to take advantage of. Like, Hey, if we find something that meets all our boxes before the lease is up, then we'll do it. If not, we'll extend the lease. So I think you got to be, you kind of have that, have that direct conversation with them. Like, Hey guys, I know we have a deadline. I want to make sure, you know, we get you um, into something before your lease is up. And I would even ask them the same question. Hey guys, let's say if we don't find something by the time your lease is up, do you guys want to still keep looking or what do you guys plan to do after that? And, and just let them know, Hey, I want to make sure I know everything so that I can serve you best. Right. I don't want to keep calling you guys to show homes if, it's not the top priority or if there's, or if it's kind of like a, yeah, if we find a deal, we do, if we don't, we don't. Mm -hmm. But I think it's good to have that conversation with them in a professional manner um, and come from a place of, I want to make sure I help you the best with what you're working with. And they will unpack it for you, right? They'll let you know like some of the answers. And then you have to decide at that point, um, is there anything I can do to push them forward faster? Because there may not be anything you can do. Yeah, it's really not. It's like really hard to find like inventory within yeah. the criteria that they're looking for. They're very specific and they're very picky. So it's been a struggle. What's the price point on this one? Um, it was up to 1.2, but they prefer to, you know, obviously get it like within the million range. Okay. Yeah. So are you showing them just what's on the MLS? Mm -hmm. And I've been trying to look for like off market, like opportunities too, but it's not within that criteria. Got it. And that's something I would discuss with them too. Hey guys, if, if this is like kind of a, you know, at a, and I would ask them scale of one to 10, just the same way I asked you scale of one to 10, how important is it for you guys to get into a home before, you know, this date and let them tell you and say, because if this is a 10, then I'm going to make it a 10 as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out every little trick I have in the book because right now, you know, I understand you guys have a exclusive criteria. This is, you know, there's certain things that you need and we're not seeing as many of these pop up on the MLS. So then what I would want to do is I would want to actually go start door knocking neighborhoods, send out postcards, contact sellers off market. I want to be able to do all of these things for you guys to find you that perfect property. But if it's not a 10, you know, 
a 10 out of 10 priority. Um, you know, I also don't, wouldn't want to go out there and, and do that if, if, if it's not a 10 out of 10 priority for you guys, right? And so maybe you need to say something like that, right? Or, or maybe say it in a different way, you know? I'm just giving you kind of some of the framework. But when you got clients who are kind of like iffy and stuff like that, sometimes you need to have that tough conversation. And then you can decide at that point, do you want to keep moving forward or not? Mm -hmm. yeah, have have like a a different a different I want to have a different mindset my what what I think what Kika is saying is imagine if you had like 50 buyers right now that were knocking on your door and says hey listen I I want to go show a house this Saturday right most likely the strategy that you're going to pick is you're going to pick the guys that are most interested right so if you look at if you look at the mindset of saying hey listen I I'm busy I need to ask direct questions right you're going to end up getting direct responses back. So the question that Kika just had wanted you to ask right now is a tough question sometimes to ask, right? Hey, listen, are you on board or are you not on board, right? But it makes things a lot easier. Let's just say, I'll just say Carla, for example, who has probably a, a, a lot of buyers that she's dealing with right now, right? It's a lot easier for her to say, hey, to have those direct conversations when she has to pick and choose who's serious and who's not serious at the moment right now, right? That's when, when, when you don't have... When there's not enough business, when you don't have enough uh, a business, you entertain a lot more BS, right? So I think what needs to happen is if you change the mindset and, and even though you don't have, maybe you don't have that many buyers to deal with right now, but I want you not to have that, 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 that confidence and say, hey, listen, I'm dealing with 50 buyers that are knocking on my door to go look at a property uh, between 10 and 12. You're going, your questions, your line of questioning is going to be a lot more direct and is going to be a lot more specific than just leaving it up in the air. And if you have that type of conversations, you're going to get the answer a lot sooner instead of finding out those answers a lot later in, in the process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Carla, what you got? I think like to add to what Robert is saying earlier, this is why it's very important. Every single morning, because of structure and being mean detailed, you have to assess who's hot, who's warm, who's cold, you have to look at your spreadsheet. You have, you have to look at your PowerPoint every single morning. And you have to realize asking all these questions. Like, I think you have more of advantage for mine because I think Rob and other experienced agents have a lot of buyers right now. So we can cut out all the bullshit and just go for it. But I think you guys have a lot more advantage since you guys are starting off on asking better questions. Because a lot of people have so much buyers right now, but they don't ask better questions. You have more, less buyers. You have more opportunity to get skilled and ask better questions. Hello. And also, uh, that's all good feedback, guys. Uh, I would also formulate, uh, you can call it something. You can say, hey guys, I know we've looked at a couple homes. I think it's important we have a strategy session. We review our strategy, right? How we're attacking this home search. And in that time, you can make it almost like it's part of like a consultation. You can call it like, hey, we're gonna, we need to do a, a new strategy session, right? Or we need to review our existing strategy of how we're helping you find a home and say, because you know the market's changing. So I need to make sure I'm changing with the market and we're making sure that we have the, the most up-to-date strategy on how we're gonna help you find the home that you need. So I would invite you to do something like that, Mai, is to set up a, a home buying strategy review. Let's review our... The existing way we're doing it and let's see if that's the most efficient way to do it or do we need to maybe update how we're attacking this and then in that you can ask those questions like hey scale of one to ten how how important is it if i found you the right home right now is that something you guys want to jump on are you guys would you guys consider yourself passively looking or really aggressively looking no they are serious it's just like also the inventory you know because they're so picky and it's really hard to find so then maybe on maybe what you can do also is is let's write down a list of your must haves which ones are like absolute deal breakers and which ones are is there some level of compromise on I don't know if you've done that right or are they just like yeah. no if it doesn't have a long five, list too. no deal you know what I mean mm -hmm. cuz sometimes you may find a home that meets four four out of the five boxes but you want to know up front like hey if I find the one that meets four out of the five boxes do you guys want to make an offer on it? Um, having a, a conversation where you're saying, hey, we're going to grade each property on a one to 10 scale. And if it's a seven, if it's an eight or nine or 10, then we got to submit an offer on it, right? Mm -hmm. 
before you even go look at home saying like, Hey, this is how this, these are the rules we're going to play by. Are you guys in agreement? Um, and even the line of questioning that Kike was using before, I mean, I would ask him straight up. I'm getting, these are the difficult conversations that we may not want to have, but we have to have like, Hey, Mr. Customer, what happens if I can't find you these, 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 uh, uh, these amenities on the house. Right. And the reason why you want to ask those types of questions, uh, my, is that it puts it into perspective in regards to, are they really a solid eight? Right. Uh, are they on a scale of one through 10? Are they really on that number there? Right. So asking, asking the positive questions, uh, there's also a flip side to it, which is really important for you to find out the negative. Now, everything goes with finesse, right? Hey, Mr. Customer, I understand that you have a long list of, of amenities that you're looking for in a home, but let me ask you this. What happens if I can't find you these types of places? I mean, what's the other option? Is the other option is that you're going to continue to rent? Is the other option that you're going to continue? Are you going to lower your standards? Like you want to find those things out, right? So even having, even phrasing the question a little bit more differently in order for you to get a response back is going to be helpful in, 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 in figuring out uh, how much effort you should be putting into a client, right? Yeah. And, and, and we're going to wrap up guys right now, but the moral of the story is you have to lead the client, right? And that's the thing is you got to take the position of leading the client. And just because you're newer, my doesn't mean you can't lead the client, right? So I want everyone to understand that, right? Doesn't matter if you're new or you're seasoned, you can still take the position of, hey, I'm here to lead you by displaying your confidence and by asking these tough questions. Because sometimes you don't know what you don't know, especially when you're a little bit newer. You don't know that there's a different way to go about business. There's a different way to sell to clients and to get them to move forward. And some of these tips and strategies are things that we have discovered over time that they actually work. So you just got to try them um, because your natural instinct as a, as a human, yeah, here's what a lot of us think. If I do that, I'm going to push them away. They're not going to want to work with me. I don't want to push too hard because then I might lose them. That's in the back of our mind a lot of times, right? So, but trust me, when you ask these questions and you say, hey, Mr. Customer, I'm coming from a place of I want to make sure I serve you the best and I'm have, I have a series of questions and you ask those, they gain a level of respect for you. They gain a level of, you know, of respect for your time and your energy and what you're trying to do versus just like, all right, when a home pops up, I'll show it to you, right? So uh, we can go on and on, guys, but the moral story is, is you got to take the lead um, and, and show your value and show your worth to some of these clients. Uh, all right, guys, I hope this helped. I hope we, we got a lot of these questions answered. Hope you guys got some insight from different people on the team. Um, do you guys like this format where we kind of keep some of these, you know, kind of loose, open-ended, you guys get to ask the questions and we answer them. Give me a thumbs up if you guys like this format or you like me just to have a topic every week that we come up with. Or we'll mix it up maybe. Yeah, we'll maybe, we'll maybe alternate on problem solving and then certain focus topics. But I think it's good to come together and just ask the questions. Yeah, mix up. Good stuff, Kimmy. Um, thank you guys who all participated. Thank you guys for who contributed. Thank you guys who were vulnerable enough to share some of the hurdles that you run into, because trust me, you're helping everybody else when they get to hear, you know, the different things coming from different people on the team. So, uh, let's make it a great week. Let me know if you guys need anything. I'll see you at the Tuesday meeting tomorrow. Let's go.